Hello everybody, my name is Marky Ray. I'm the production manager here at the Beachland Ballroom. I'm publicly renowned as the rock and roll mercenary. But I'm also an artist, a musician, and a tri seat professor, and a music historian and archivist who has worked extensively with the Neo Soundboard at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Archive to help save and preserve our musical legacy. Briefly, I have a long history in the Cleveland punk music scene, and I was fortunate enough to come up in between the many generations of older punks that came before me. By the time I arrived in the music scene in Cleveland in the late 70s and early 80s, when I started playing in the area, Peter Lochner had already passed on into legend. I never knew him, but I knew a lot of his legacy, and I got to know many of the people who knew him, and I'm very lucky I've, I've come up and, and to live, survive, and occasionally uh, thrive throughout the musical landscape of Cleveland and Northeast Ohio, if you will. In 2011, I started working on my master's degree at the University of Akron. My master's thesis was based on the fact that outside of London and New York, uh, no other city had a proto-punk scene other than Cleveland, albeit a small one. This was actually mentioned in the preface of Clinton Hanlon's wonderful book, From the Velvets to the Voidoids. It was then that I went about writing and interviewing many of the Cleveland punks, pardon my, pardon my page turning here, uh, need large font for my old eyes, um, I, I managed to interview a number of luminaries and soon started, and who soon started writing uh, their own books, and this spurred many people to want to tell their own stories. By the time I finished my master's in 2012, many of the Klee punks had started to document their own personal histories, which led to a new revival of all things Klee in Northeast Ohio punk rock. I was lucky enough to meet Aaron and Jake a number of years ago when I was helping the Fantasy Nightclub sell off the contents of the club that they were closing at the time at the last Death of Samantha show. Being both aware of Aaron and Jake's artwork, I, know that they both had, I knew that they both had special talents that would be imperative to saving and archiving. These are artists, their works are very important, and the music scene needs preservation, like all of our musical history. Uh, this has been my own personal mission statement to save what we had, had left or could find. I told Aaron I wanted to get together with him and I knew he, I had materials that he would be interested in for his book, which we discussed that night. I subsequently took Aaron along with Crazy Dave Atkins over to my dear friend Cat City Bobby's house, five miles that way as the crow flies. Uh, it was very dilapidated and trashed at the time, but we found what we could. It was there that we found Peter's handwritten phone number on a piece of paper on the floor amongst the detritus. Moving forward to today, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> Um, I, I would just like to say, little did I know what Aaron, Aaron had in store. Uh, when I finally saw what he had wrought, I suggested to the Beachland we should hold a book signing for this, a book signing event. I felt that this is an incredibly important work of our collect, collective music history, and that we had to have this event. That this book is that good. Uh, I feel in my own opinion, and for what it's worth, it's the best, most encapsulating music book, let alone punk rock graphic novel that has ever been written, drawn, put together, etc., etc., or ever fully captured the very essence of our people, places, and things that make up our fair city and region. Uh, so people, please let me introduce from Stone Church Press, Aaron Lang and his partner, Jake Kelly on the DJ booth back there, and from Cleveland Public Library, our interviewer, the wonderful John Sturdick. Thank you, gentlemen. Hi, everybody. Hey, thanks everybody for coming out. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start. A, we're going to start a little bit about uh, beginning. We want to know a little bit about uh, both your backgrounds. But you can talk a little bit about you know where you're from, and uh, 
No, kind of the area first. Yeah, sure. I was born in. Uh, can you hear me? Is this good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was born in Old Brooklyn. Uh, we moved out to North Olmsted when I was very young. Uh, then in 1999, I left Cleveland and went down to Columbus for art school. Then I was in Philadelphia for a long time, and I moved back here about six years ago, which is more or less when I really started working on uh, my book in earnest. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I pretty much moved here. We moved around when I was a kid, and we moved up here when I was, I think, in third or fourth grade. Jake doesn't like people to know that he wasn't born here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, graduated Fairview High School, class of 96, and uh, let's see, I, I lived at Speaking Tongues for a while in the late 90s, and uh, you know, lived all over the city, uh, to maybe probably 2,000 show posters over the years for the Beachland and yeah. the Grog Shop, and you know, every other place, Dick Orr, Patch in the Flats, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> there, you should write a book about living and speaking tongues right there. But <laughs> Somebody already wrote a book. Right. And yeah. they interviewed, they interviewed uh, a lot of the people that lived there, and I didn't, <clears throat> it had been like six years had elapsed since the yeah. interview and when the book came out, and I just kind of thumbed through it really quick to make sure I didn't say anything really stupid <laughs> that I forgot about. <laughs> um, so could you guys talk a little bit about uh, the two of you meeting and the birth of the company? Stone Church. Well, I knew um, I knew Jake kind of by reputation. I picked up a uh, Xerox collection of some of his flyer stuff, so I knew who he was. And uh, then we met in person. I was living in Philadelphia, but I was in town. There's um, every year there's a small press indie comic book festival here called Genghis Khan, and I met Jake there. It was actually in that other room. It was. Yeah, it was yeah. like the first one, seventy five feet away from us. Yeah. <laughs> And so I'd kind of see him every year, and we stayed in touch. And then obviously when I moved back to Cleveland, we started uh, communicating more. And, uh, you know, we'd kvetch and bitch and grouse and talk about how we hated everybody and everything. And it's like, well, why don't we start our own publishing company? And, you know, no one can fucking tell us what to do. You know, we can uh, shove it up their asses. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah, that's the one I'm So following both of your work, for um, maybe to start with Jake, you know, before we get into Aiden Fun, um, sort of what, what kind of uh, was the, you know, the impetus for some of the work you've done? Like uh, you're very interested in old time vice, sleaze, Cleveland, a little bit of everything. Yeah, the, the books, the series I've been working on for the last three or four years is called Death, Destruction, Vice, and Sleaze. And it's about Cleveland in the 70s, you know, and the bombs and the pornography and the obscenity battles and, you know, outlaw motorcycle gangs and, you know, death, destruction, vice, and sleep. Uh, and, you know, I think I always kind of had an interest in that stuff, you know, and, you know, you hear people tell you some story that, like, the mayor had the garbage men take around a pole on pornography or <laughs> something. You're like, wait, what? Yeah. So, you know, I've got that kind of, I'm a snoop, so I, you know, I'm like, well, let's research this further. And I always kind of had, as far as death, destruction, vice, and sleaze, it was something that was always on the back burner, that I wanted to, you know, do this nonfiction thing about Cleveland in the 70s. But I sort of knew that I was going to have to touch on the music, and that was such a, like, can of worms that when he <laughs> showed me his Ain't It Fun pages, I was like, oh. He's doing it. Right. I don't have to worry about it. If someone's like, you didn't mention uh, Rock from the Tombs, I'm like, read this book. Right. <laughs> and your style is, uh, you know, like when I looked through it over the years, it's kind of really uh, almost like a documentary. I, I don't know. It's like, it, it, what, what kind of uh, films or things influenced you? Oh, geez. I mean, I, I consume a lot of documentaries. You can um, see it in your work for sure, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean. <clears throat> You know, in terms of, like, comics and stuff, I have pretty, you know, I guess, run-of-the-mill underground tastes, like, you know, Robert Crumb and Dan Close and those yeah. kind of things. Um, and I would say probably the one of the biggest influences is actually the Cleveland Public Library photo collection. I'd like to hear this. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that's kind of how I, how I met, I'm always posting things from the history of the Cleveland Public Library online. And uh, it's just so heartening that, uh, you know, you two, like, you know, all this work that we're doing on the back end, and there's like, uh, 
also two weirdos who also like this. Yeah. <laughs> what is? How have you described John in the past? I, I'm not sure, but it does feel like you're watching me sometimes. <laughs> I'll be like deep in the Plain Dealer Historic Archive, looking up something, and you like post a picture of it. I'm like, what? The well, fuck? that's the camera in your house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think well, you described well, John as our Greek chorus. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, maybe you touched on some of the comic artists. Uh, is was there anybody like kind of local comic that you know like you looked up to when you were growing up and kind of were like, oh, this is the style I like? Um, yeah, for sure. What a <clears throat> Uh, there, I was going to say there was a guy, there is a guy uh, named Clay Parker who did, yeah, give it up for Clay. Uh, he did like tons of amazing posters in the 90s and he, between him and Derek locally, that I think is what put the weird idea that like, oh, you can be like a flyer artist as a job, which is not a thing you could do. <laughs> Other cities <laughs> don't do that. Uh, but yeah, Clay Parker definitely, because he captured, you know, like the sleazy heat of <laughs> a Cleveland summer, like really well. Right. And uh, so, sort of going, in, I, I think that kind of fits in with like the hidden histories too, you know, of, 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 and then we'll get into that more uh, in, in your book, but uh, I think that's what I think when I hear that name, like <laughs> what people may not know bubbling beneath. Yeah, and you know, like, <clears throat> doing so many posters and flyers and stuff and it's such a weird transient art form, you know what I mean? It, like it hangs on the telephone pole and then rots off the telephone pole. Yeah. And I don't know if anyone knows who Sean Carey is, but she uh, was in, she lived in LA in the 80s and she did uh, like she did the Germs logo and the Circle Jerks skank and dude. She did tons of posters and stuff and she, she had this great quote where she said, the first time I saw my one of my flyers floating <laughs> down the street in the sewer, I knew I'd made it. <laughs> what was your first poster that you did in town? Let's see. I mean, I was doing posters for bands that I was in. Uh, <clears throat> and then I lived at Speaking Songs and did, you know, like when I say posters, we're talking about like 11 by 7, or 11 by 8 and a half by 11 flyers. Yeah. Uh, and then. My girlfriend at the time was like, why don't you go to the grog shop in the beach line and like, see if you can get paid to do mm -hmm. Crazy flyers. Idea. And I said, okay, let's see, if the, let's try this out. Yeah. And I went to the grog shop and, you know, this is like 2000 maybe. Yeah. And I showed her like a portfolio stuff and she was like, all right, how much do you want? <laughs> and I was like, $20? <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta understand at the time, $20 was a lot of money. I right. could get a, like a pack of smokes, a bottle of Carlo Rossi, I could eat two <laughs> meals at Steve's Hot Dog Lunch, Ooh, <laughs> and you know, then I still got like bus fare left over. Uh, and then ex that exact same day, I came here and talked to Cindy, and I said, you know, I'm doing posters for the grog shop now. <laughs> you know, I thought maybe you guys want to let me do some flyers, and then, yeah, then... Thank you, Cindy. It went on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Cindy. Um, one more time, so, you know, being a, a person who went to speak, speak in tongues, those flyers, it, it, you know, you can see, and, and, and we were talking to Marky, that they, they do live in sort of, uh, people are interested still. Do, have you saved all of your work, or have you digitized it? I've saved all of the stuff uh, that I did, and yeah, it's digitized in some form or another. Yeah. Uh, and I've done some books and stuff, and I don't know, maybe someday if I'm run out of ideas, I'll make like a gigantic Omnibus collection or something. Uh, I'm in. Yeah, those are, that, I mean, they're beautiful. And I, I just, Thanks. you know, working at the library, a lot of uh, stuff will get into the book. People are interested in it, and now it's all kind of here. So I think digitizing that, uh, or put that book out. Um, uh, so can you guys talk about what was the decision from the from the team to self-produce this this work? Uh, no, no, fun. Nobody else will do it. I had an agent in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we thought with Stone Church Press, we'd be like, hey, we got a place we could do our mini comics and zines, and we could do smaller publications. And I always thought I'd get uh, Aid of Fun out from a publisher, uh, and I had an agent and all this, and you know, you know, the publishing houses in New York were like Cleveland, <laughs> who, <laughs> right. what, you know? <laughs> it was like, all right, looks like we're doing this, uh, doing this ourselves, and. Um, it's, you know, it was stressful. There's a lot more to worry about, but, um, you know, we've been kind of learning as we go and it's yeah. been working out. I don't think I ever asked you this. Did he tell, would he, like, phone you up and be like, done, reject it again? <laughs> or did he, like, keep all that stuff from you when he was, like, shopping it around to people? No, no, he was, he was, he, no, he was very transparent. He oh, knows. okay. Uh, yeah, he 
we would forward all the emails. Um, well, when the publishers even bothered to respond and say sure, no, sure. usually just fucking ignored us. <laughs> um, well, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, like you, you look at the book, you think it's, uh, I've been telling people about this for a while. You think it maybe just, uh, I mean, it is wonderful. You get the Cleveland History Regional, but it really is bigger than that. Once you read the book, you see it's, it's really about a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see it as having, you know, I hope it grows and the word gets out because it's it's about so much more than just this area and region. Yeah, I never quite honed my elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which I, maybe I should do. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's not an easy book to summarize because it's not a biography of Peter Lochner. Well, it is and it isn't and it's more... Um, yeah, like I, like I said, I still have to work in my elevator. <laughs> right. Well, that's right. Here. So, so ta um, but I think it's important to talk about, like, why, uh, what inspired you? Like, what made you decide, okay, this is going to be the nexus for all of this stuff that's going on? Why, why this book? Um, why did I make, what's the, I'm sorry. What's so, the like, ain't it fun? Like, why, I mean, what? Was the thing you're like? I have. I, I got to put this out in the world. What What made you think like I have? I got. I got to produce this. Sure. Sure. Okay. So I'd always been interested in uh, the Cleveland punk scene, and uh, Peter Lochner in particular was kind of interesting to me. And uh, I remember one day I just got a bug at my ass, and I was like, I should write something about Peter Lochner. I thought it would be like eight pages, just a quick little thing I do for like one of my mini comics, and it. Uh, Ended up kind of getting a little bit longer. It was more like twenty some pages, and as I was, you know, <laughs> twenty pages seemed long to me at the time, right? Yeah. And as I was working on that, I was like, you know, I think to understand uh, Peter and to understand the punk scene, you have to know a little bit about Cleveland, sure, and its background, uh, the industrial history, and it's kind of like weird, like the way it's kind of isolated here, even though it shouldn't be. Uh, you know, it used to be a trade center, uh, but. You need to talk about that just to contextualize things. Here's the word, contextualize. Yeah. <laughs> you contextualize yourself to 450. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I did this this short, uh, you know, this short thing about Peter, and a friend of mine ended up burning on his website, and it kind of started to get some heat. And uh, it was like trafficking, trafficking around, and people were messaging me and emailing me, uh, people that knew a lot about Peter people that knew Peter, and I was like, man, there's like, so there's a lot more to tell here. Mm -hmm. I was like, I should maybe like expand this to a book, and I looked up like, what's the minimum length of pages <laughs> for a graphic novel, and it was like 80 pages. I was like, I could, I could bilk this out to 80 pages, and uh, <laughs> you know, and that was the, that was the plan. Uh, I was like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll work on this for like a year or two, and, uh, and it just kind of got crazier and crazier and bigger and just bigger. Just kept going. And I'm still kicking myself about things I wish I could have included. Um, I was going to was, was ask that. Like, was there anything that... So, who here has read the book? Woo! Okay, great, great, great. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we're not like... Some, some people know. Spoiler alert. Was there... <laughs> was there anything that you ran up against that you're like, oh, this is just too much. This is like... I'm not going to bother contextualizing this part or whatever. It's something that was just a Pandora's box you didn't want to open. And you're like, fuck it, I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah, I, mean, I initially wanted to talk about the um, the various mob-related bombings because I think that would uh, just kind of is like a backdrop to like what was going on in the yeah. city, um, this hellish landscape. But it <laughs> never, it didn't, it just always dead-ended. It never really connected to anything else. And so it was just like, well... Forget about it, you know, because like, I think there's actually there's a page of the um, we have a, did a limited edition book of like cut pages for the book. There's one page in there that does have something about the bombings, because uh, I was seriously thinking about including that. But yeah, that's something. It, it, well, that was a Pandora's box that mm -hmm. just never, no, it is. never really connected. And then you were saying that things that you wish you could have included. You were about to talk about that a little bit. And just the other day, some random guy on Facebook posted a um, little blurb, I think it was from Cream, that Peter wrote about television. And uh, there was a line where he said, listening to television is like uh, riding the subway through the pinball machine and like humming and puking at the same time. <laughs> and I was like, why the that fuck? That would have fit in the book. I was like, why the fuck did I quote? Like, well, this, this is a great line. How did I... Volume two. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, that, that is a good question because you talked a little bit about like psychogeography. Like when you looked at, I, I find that book very cinematic. In Act One, we get the background before sort of Peter, and uh, you start from you know Moses Cleveland uh, or no before that, like going back to the beginning. How was that? How did you think about that in the structure of building this work? Like how important was Cleveland's past to get to that point? Um. Well, I think Jake and I would joke about, like, well, there were glaciers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can almost kind of, like, hate talking about this stuff because it's become so, like, woke or lame or predictable. But I kind of, I did want to honor uh, the people who lived here before us. I wanted to honor the, the Native Americans and honor the Adina Hopewell people. Yeah. And not in some, like, bullshit way, uh, but... You know, I didn't. I did it because I wanted to do it, not because I felt like I had to. Right. Um, it's hard to talk about. Um, but yeah, it's just why. Why not start from the beginning? It works though, because I mean, I don't see it as like something like. I mean, it really. There's not that much of the history of Cleveland. You know, as someone who researches the history of Cleveland, you, you don't get that much. So that's why I really. It was really like hard. To, it was. I would have liked to have more stuff on the Native Americans. Um. But it was, it's a really difficult thing to research. And one thing you kind of learn is like, the population of natives, it was not a gigantic population. It was a pretty sparse population. Right. And, um, and the Eries that were here, they were wiped out by the Iroquois. So there really wasn't a lot of activity in Northeast Ohio. In Southern parts of the state, there was a lot more activity. Uh, but it was pretty barren up here. So there's like, it, Maybe, I mean, maybe if someone knows a text or a source uh, that I'm not familiar with, I'd love to hear about it, but there's just like, I yeah. wasn't finding much. No, we have questions often, and that's why I think it's important to include that. You just don't see that it's too much. Um, it's always the southern part of the state they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, when I said it's cinematic, I wanted to ask you just from reading it, like your use of maps in, in the work. like. Um, why was that? I, I love those maps, uh, just as a, like a, a history nerd, and they're so detailed. But why did you include? That's kind of a recurring throughout. Uh, you know, as a kid, I always liked like you could get like some fantasy book, like Lord of the Rings or something, and they'd have like a map of like this this fantasy place, or like uh, you're for, like into a video game as a kid. Maybe there was like a map of this video game world, and those oh, yeah. types of fantasy maps are always very appealing. And I kind of like the idea of taking that aesthetic and idea but doing it for something real and it's not a map about getting from X point to Y point it's not about directions but using a map to talk about time uh, to talk about events and then by virtue of it being a map it connects time and events to space cool. Yeah, really the, the gravity point, the, the the downtown stuff. For those of you who read it, I think that's the really that's a really interesting device used early on, which I, you know, you, you read about this and you forget it. So, what I love about the book um, is you just get so caught up in reading this, and then you have to go back because your images are just so wonderful. Uh, it just took me. I, I had to go back. Uh, why did you know? And you guys are both season like working on graphic novels and comics why didn't you use the sequential format in this book why did you choose this sort of storytelling device you mean not using like a panel yeah grid? right i you know the grid the grid structure traditional panels in a comic book like you'd see in the sunday comic pages or a spider-man comic it's you know it's very effective for um certain things uh i find it kind of boring to draw that way yeah and uh <clears throat> It wasn't like a conscious choice. It's just kind of like I started moving away from that more traditional format, kind of naturally, uh, because I, you know, every every bit of dialogue, so to speak, in the book is a quote. I'm not making up dialogue um, or like fictionalizing scenarios or like filling in gaps between. It's not like a biopic movie where someone's doing their research, but they're also kind of. Uh, Telling a story in a traditional fictional format. Exterior day. Peter Lofner steps off the bus <laughs> yeah. in front of CBG. <laughs> so yeah, my book is very—it's driven by narration, which is kind of atypical for comics. So I think 
being more narratively driven, it needed a different uh, visual structure. Okay. Um, now I want to get into a little research and how you work. Did you uh, put some of these pages uh, past Jake to uh, like am I on the right path? Do you guys work collaboratively on some of the, your works together? What's um, the relationship? So Jake's one of the few people I was showing the stuff to early on. Like Jake's probably maybe the only person that saw the first draft. And uh, this is before we even started Stone Church Press. Yeah, that was maybe like four or more years ago. Maybe like. five, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of like just showing it to Jay just so I wasn't like completely working in a void. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think Jake probably helped me out with uh, some tips on like the archives of the library. Right. And uh, my friend Andrew, who's a seasoned researcher, <laughs> uh, gave a lot of uh, advice on yeah. just like, I mean, because you start out, you want to write something, you're just like Googling like every other idiot. <laughs> and, and, like, let me tell you something, people. Not everything is online. In fact, you know, most things of interest are not. Uh, but, and yet, that's only half true because the internet, what is invaluable in doing a book like this, because what is online is information about archives. Right. You have to go to the archive in person, but, you know, the internet will guide you to said archives and guide you to people who you can then talk to, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, just getting your hands dirty and going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame archives or the Filthy Clinton, place. <laughs> the Clinton State University archives, the Plain Dealer archives, which are digital for the, for the library, yeah. and you just start to see stuff. You're like, whoa, this, this changes everything. And it's, you know, the information's out there, you should be willing to look and know how to look. Right. And it's there, I, I, and uh, thank you to Andrew would come down, and you, because like you're doing the work for us for the next person, the next evolution of this story, the next person who does something, you've laid this out, this work, and uh, that it, it's great, I love that people use this stuff and come down, but uh, every everything moves, moves the ball down the field, I love that, you know. My, and, and, and it, uncovers uh, new avenues of research when you do this. Yeah, I mean, it's an awesome resource. I'm so thankful of it. Yeah. <clears throat> well, number one, I'm thankful that every issue of The Plain Dealer is like at my fingertips. Did you <laughs> the CEO it? website, that's so insane. Right. I'm trying to get one day the Cleveland Press. I think that's another one. I would love to. You know, hopefully before I, I wish it. I wish that that, like, computer database that used to be in the photo center where you could, like, type in an address. Yeah. And it would show, you could just type in like Euclid Avenue and it would right. show you like all of the Euclid Avenue photos they had. Right. <clears throat> yeah, you like using the microfiche. <laughs> I do like it. Well, I mean, you know, it was like one step up from microfiche. And then <laughs> the guy said that last time I was there, one of the few times I was there, I was like, whatever happened to that thing? I was like, the computer was so old that no one knew how to fix it anymore. <laughs> that's, a, that's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we talked a little bit about research in these, but but you, I mean, good lord, you you had to you, years and years. Can you tell any stories about some of the research you had to do, or like, um, or the you know, like what was what was your what was your routine like to kind of do this? Oh God, my routine? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you were there, dude. <laughs> was I don't know. I, was, I wonder if I was. Um, Rituals, anything? <laughs> okay, well, so you, 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 like, I made a lot of dumb mistakes. I mean, like, I, the first draft of the book was a disaster. You, you start to learn you have to, like, look at, like, various sources and, because, uh, like, I mean, there's just misinformation out there. Uh, I'll say one exception. If you want to know about the Sam Shepard case, James Neff book, that's the only one you need to read. It's great. <laughs> you, don't need, you don't need to look at other sources. James Neff killed it. That is the final word on that subject, top to bottom. Uh, I can't necessarily say that about other subjects. No, that's a great example of what I was saying. Like, you know, oh, this is, the, yeah, I feel like case closed. We got something here. Mm -hmm. And there's been so much. That's one of those subjects the Shepherd, you know, like, and uh, it figures in into your work, you know, and yeah, Peter, Lop, Peter growing up in Bay Village. Yeah. You know? All right, so here's, here's some funny research uh, anecdotes. So I would uh, call the Bay Village uh, Library or the Bay Village Historical Society, and uh, you know, they'd answer the phone. I'd say, "Hi, my name's Aaron Lang. I'm working on a book." And they'd say, 
is this about Sam Shepard? Uh, <laughs> and uh, then I, went, I was like, no, I'm actually researching uh, about a local musician. Like, is this about Peter Lochner? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it is. Um, <laughs> So those are the those are the Bay Village celebrities in that order. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what was I mean? You worked on this so long. Was there ever a time you're like, I I, I got to throw in the towel, or this is? I mean, it's just such an undertaking. Yeah, there was a certain point where I was like, Am I? Like, I was, you know, when I was doing editing, when I was fixing stuff and correcting stuff. You know, when you're doing a comic, you're not just going into a word document and doing some editing. It's like. You know, I hand draw these pages, so I was doing changes. I had to get an exacto knife out, and I'd like cut chunks of text out, and paste in a new piece of Bristol board and redo it. And I, I must have spent a year or two just doing revisions. And so when during that period, I was like, "Am I just dilly dallying? Am I, if I lost my mind? Am I like, tr am like subconsciously do I not want to finish this?" Are those Russian animators who've been making that one movie for forty years <laughs> 40 now, years, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I guess when you're when you're all consumed and a, a story like Peter's of, I mean, it's March toward death at an early age, you know, like, did, did it affect you at all or like think uh, the, the story I'm telling, you know, <laughs> Could it, were you depressed at times, you know, like reading it, you know, like, Oof, this is some heavy stuff too. Um, you know, I would like slip in and out of like kind of being like obsessed with it and like really just like too involved with it. And then I like slip out and like it kind of like when I was researching and writing I could get pretty invested, but then when I was drawing, I, I could kind of like I would sort of check out, and it was sort of just like uh, going through the motions. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that does. It. I remember when you <clears throat> at some point saying that when you started it, you were more focused on the whole like death tripping angle of it. I was. Yeah. What, what that's kind of, that's was there? Reason. What was like a turning point where you said that this is going to go in another direction? Was there like, was it just a more more fullness of the story being revealed to you, or what? Well, you know, I got older. Um, I think that's part of it, and it became a bigger project than I anticipated. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to do something, put this many years to a project and a project this long, maybe it shouldn't have like. Not just like a fuck you kind of message. You know, maybe I should try that. Sure, sure, sure. Maybe it should just be like a nihilistic middle finger to everybody. It can be a tough sell for a man in his 40s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's covered in there, but yeah. Yeah, it's still there. I mean, you can't, you can't ignore the, the death tripping aspect because, I mean, it's just part of it. Yeah. It's part of rock and roll. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, you people? <laughs> I mean, if, you, if, if rock and roll without death is just pop music, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> Chuck, you know, we, we talked a lot about uh, Cleveland, but did you, did you, uh, what did you, how did you tackle all of the Akron music? Did, were, were there was there a different kind of research that you took on for for Akron? Did you visit there? I and mean, we're going to talk to. Uh, uh, how are we later, but I didn't do any specific research missions there. No, no okay. um, well, just the Akron sound is really interesting. You covered any so much, but I was just kind of curious on that. Yeah, I don't think the research was any uh, different. Um, it's just less in depth. Um, okay. like I didn't get into like the uh, geography of Akron really. Okay, the, yeah, the, the, the architecture. I just find that that was interesting. You know, there's there were so many pages. I'm like, oh, you, you sent me down the like a, a day of a hole. <laughs> You know stuff I didn't know. Um, can we, so uh, I know it's hard to. Uh, you're, you're still in the process of uh, promoting this, but can we talk about like? Are, are you? You know what, what's next? What, what are you thinking? <laughs> we have laughed about this question, where you like. I spent ten years, <laughs> two years working on this book, and now it's finally. What are you gonna do next? <laughs> That's um, one of those energy questions you gotta ask. <laughs> Yeah, I got another book I want to write, but I don't want to talk about it. No, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> then I don't want it. No, that, that, you know, um, no, I've just learned from experience. It's not good to talk about things you're going to do because life has a way of, you know, happening. And, you know. How about you, Jim? Well, that's the funny thing about comics is, you know, they take so long to draw. You know, you any research into it is a huge thing. Right. Then, like, writing it. That's a huge thing, like getting everything straight and then like 
you know, trying to find some fucking printed out news article, you know what it looks like, and you're searching through stacks of paper, whatever. Uh, and then you have to actually draw it, <laughs> which is like arduous. Right. So that's where all your, that's like when your mind is like, you know what I would rather be doing? It's a book about X, Y, and Z. Like there have been so many points working on Death, Destruction, Price, and Slaves where I'm like, I should have just made all this shit. <laughs> like, it would have been, it yeah. so much easier. Do like some cursory research and then just make some shit. And nobody it. would be the wiser. I think a lot of people do that, but that's why this is uh, next level stuff. So, um, you know, now you, you're so immersed in Peter. Like, I know this is a broad question, and I don't know how to say it, but like your takeaways looking back now, I'm like, you know, did, you know, were, were you, did you listen to the music while you're doing this? Did you become a fan of his? Of, of his work as well? Well, I was a fan before. Um, if anything, I became less likely to listen to it. Yeah. It's <laughs> just too much. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just like you're, like, too, I got too close to it. Um, you know, it's not, like, if, not, if I'm, like, cleaning up around the house or just doing stuff, I'm not like, oh, yeah, I listen to some Peter Locker. I'm like, no. <laughs> no, when I finished the book, I took all my stuff and I packed it up and, right. you know. What about, so, um, you know, the, and, and I, I want to go back to the, you know, the structure one more time. Like, the third act, you know, uh, was that, um, there, there's just so much packed in this book. I never know, like, the, you know, like, what was the decision to kind of do it after Peter Pass? Did you want to show, you know, like, what his work meant to the next wave? I mean, was that sort of a decision? Well, I think that death has more weight when you see the time after you know, because yeah. everyone else... And that's like, why I liked it, yeah. It's like it, 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 the story doesn't end because a, a hole was left. Right. And I think that's very sad. Yeah, there, there is so much. Um, so before we kind of get to our next guest, is there anything else you guys want to talk about in the book that I might have missed? Or, Jake, is there anything you can think of? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> that, that was good. Let's bring some other people in. All right. Here. Yeah, we're gonna later on. We'll have um, some time for questions after. Hey there. So uh, we're gonna introduce a couple of other guests here. Uh, I'd like to introduce and bring to the stage Mr. Jim Ellis. Uh, Jim was a, a Drome regular and uh, also put out Clee Magazine or Clee Mag, I should say. Which is Clee Clee Mag was a fanzine, very important one that encapsulated the scene back in the day for the Drome. And uh, so I'd like to invite up Mr. Jim Ellis, and from Akron, our wonderful dear friend, uh, dear friend of mine, Harvey Gold of the wonderful band Tin Huey, yeah. Golems of the Red Planet. Yeah. Dear friend, grateful to have him. Thank you for coming, guys. It's really great to meet you. Um, and you know, Jake, Aaron, just jump into your questions as we go along sure. here. Um, Jim, you sat down first. I'm going to attack you first here. Uh, so a lot of people know how you know how important Klee um, was, uh, but can you talk about sort of the inception? Um, you know, when did he start and why did it come about? Well, Peter had already passed on by the time the first Klee came out, and um, I was working at the Drone Record Store, and um, I don't know how many people remember the place up on the top of Cedar Hill, but um, it started off as a little hippy dippy record store. And then uh, Pete Lochner started working there, and um, he, uh, I met Peter there and started hanging out with him, and he got me a job there. And um, the guys from WRUW, well, Michigan Mom and Gary Malika used to come in, and they were the ones who picked up on the, the, the new records that we were uh, listening to, and the fanzines started showing up, like uh, Sniff and Glue and Punk and New York Rocker and... Uh, Backdoor Man and Bomb and all that stuff. And um, so it just seemed like there was all this activity and that, you know, we should start doing something with um, all this stuff that was going on at the drum. Yeah. And um, that's really what the impetus was. I used to work with uh, David Thomas. He was going by the name Crocus Behemoth in those days. <laughs> and, um, and he's still wearing the black trench coat, you know, and had the frizzed out hair, and, you know, he would chain smoke uh, camels all day. And um, and we were hanging out at the drone uh, at the counter one day, and people would just stop by. It came, became kind of like a community center, and uh, Bob Farrell, who was a photographer for the Scene magazine, came by, and he had a picture of the Dead Boys, 
playing a, a festival at Chippewa Lake Park right before they got booed off stage. <laughs> and, you know, we just kind of laughed about it because, you know, the world wasn't really ready for the Dead Boys in 1977 or 76, at least not outside of New York. So, um, so we were looking at this photo and, and Crocus turned to me and said, hey, you know, you're not doing anything. You should start a fanzine. I said, okay. Now, little did he know that I had done fanzines when I was in middle school and high school. I put out an underground newspaper. I was really, really well versed into all the underground press. Yeah. And but I hadn't really thought anything of it at that point. And I thought, oh yeah, okay, this sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. And so we just did the first issue right there. Um, it took about a week to, to put it together. There was a guy named uh, Mick Mellon who had pictures of Peter's funeral. We included those in there. Um, the Destroy All Monsters band was coming in to play at the Pirate's Cove with Perubu on Thursday nights. And um, I'm trying to think what else is in there. I think Charlotte wrote, a, wrote an article on Devo. I think that was in that first issue. Kristen Band, if anyone knows Kristen, who's still doing music today, she wrote an article on Perubu. Yeah, and so what did that, so I'm glad you brought up the, 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 the photo. What was the feedback about putting the photo in there? Did you get any you know, people interested? Was there any anybody angry? I mean, there were a couple people that thought it was morbid. Yeah. You know, but I mean, generally speaking, no, there was there were no issues. I believe Charlotte picked the the line for the poem from Delmore Sports that we printed, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and then we sent a copy off to Jane Scott. That was my next. That was my question. <laughs> and, uh, so she did. So Jane wrote wrote about uh, it. Yeah. yeah, so so Gary Malico was uh, the guy who was my friend at the time, and he was playing a lot of stuff on WRUW. RUW was really the only station playing these records at the time, all 10 watts of it. You know? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'm trying to think where I was headed with that. So, um, so yeah, we sent one off to, to Jane Scott, and she had us come down to the plane dealer and she wrote an article about it, or about Klee. And then the next thing you know, it's like people were ordering Klee. You know, sending it, you know, their dollar or whatever it costs. To so she was still powerful at that time. Kind of, uh, sure. you know. Yeah, I mean, it was just a wonderful experience to, to meet, you know, Jane. So, um, yeah, so Jane was, you know, did a world of publicity for us. And then that kind of just encouraged us to keep doing it. Do you remember what your print run was for the first issue? I think it was 500, I think, maybe. Oh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't know any. We didn't know what we were doing. So, I mean, you know, it seemed like a good idea Let's just make a whole bunch. <laughs> yeah, just make a whole bunch. How long so did it take to get rid of the oh, oh, you know, years and years and years. Yeah, so, um, so then, yeah, so then it just kept going. And, you know, I never did find, like, a regular printer. I mean, the second issue, I think we did at the Call and Post. They were the ones who actually printed it. I actually think we did the second and the third wow. issue at the Call and Post. Um, was that before Don King owned the Call and Post? I don't know. I don't, I don't remember seeing him around there, but we would go down <laughs> and, and they would give us these galleys that, you know, we had to paste our stuff up in so that we could take it back there and run it through their uh, web offset printing presses. And they actually had the printing presses down in the basement and all the all the layouts and everything were done upstairs. Right. Um, so that's, yeah, that's why they're on, they're on really cheap newsprint, if anybody <laughs> remembers. I mean, they're all yellow and they're just basically falling apart. Um, that was how we did the, the next two issues. Were you playing, were you uh, in bands during the time, like jazz? Um, were, were you playing during this, and what bands were you in at that time? So I met uh, a guy named Andrew Climax, who was Jamie <laughs> Climax's uh, younger brother. And uh, Andrew was uh, writing songs with Laura Kennedy, who was ended up going to New York and starting the Bush Tetris. Yeah. And um, they asked me to play guitar in their band called Tender Buttons. So um, I was a guitar player for Tender Buttons briefly. And then uh, through Andrew, I met John Morton. And John was doing a band, well, it was a visual arts band called Johnny and the Dicks. They didn't play music, but they did performance art. And they ended up putting out a record that was just a sleeve with no record in it. <laughs> they, and we sold them at the drum, by the way, um, for five bucks. And, uh, 
And uh, then John decided he was going to do a band. He wanted to do a band uh, before he went to New York because he decided that he was never going to be make it as an artist in Cleveland. He had to go to New York. And so that was part of that whole migration. Everybody had started going to New York. Tim Wright had gone to New York. And um, Brad Fields had gone to New York. And um, so everybody was, was starting to move to New York because it was a bigger scene. And a lot of those people, I think, were New Yorkers at heart anyway. You know, Cleveland was too small for them. It all happened at once, though. Quite a few people, right? Yeah, they started, yeah, it just started to be a steady stream of people. Mm -hmm. But uh, I ended up playing with John Morton and uh, Andrew, and then a couple, like, Anton Fear became our drummer. Yeah. Um, and it was a band Thanks. called X-Plank X. -Plank X. Yeah. yeah, and then, Johnny, I think in your, uh, there's footage of that, that Spaces show. Do you, do you remember what I'm talking about with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's footage of Johnny the Dicks on yeah. YouTube. And, yeah. um, it's terrifying, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that show, yeah. It's a lot different than the way you hear it described. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot weirder. And there's like not a lot of people, it's like, there's like not many people there, which just makes it even weirder. Well, they played in an L-shaped room at Spaces, so you couldn't see the band. I mean, you couldn't see the group. They were actually performing around the corner, and there were two video cameras set up. Right. So all the people in the audience had to watch it on video, even though they could hear it going on around the corner. Wow. I love that you covered it. Well, you're the Jeff Beck of the chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to get? Well, I'm going to come back to uh, some more quick questions, but uh, thanks, Harvey. I, I think if you could start at the beginning, too, with... You know, Tim Ewing before that rags. You can talk about sort of the early days of the of the band. Tell us a little bit how it how it started. Tim Ewing. Yeah. Oh dear. Um, Charlotte. I have a question. I'm sorry. I've been I've been sort of listening to you guys, but I've really been staring at Aaron's tie. And, uh, it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> Tim Huey started as a band called Rags, which uh, I was not a part of, um, which would do really long drug-induced versions of uh, That Would Be Something by Paul McCartney <laughs> and Substitute. I think that's the only two songs they did. And then uh, we found an organ somewhere, so I was like, oh, let's get Harvey to play keyboards. Right. And uh, at which point, as I told you earlier, the lead guitarist of the band, who later became the bassist of Tim Huey, had to go to Fallsview for a while. Uh -huh. um, some of you know what that is, and those of you who don't can guess. And uh, the other three of us formed Tim Huey and started out playing, you know, uh, early T Rex stuff and a lot of uh, wonky stuff. And then we went electric and. Uh, brought Mark back in to play bass, and uh, eventually got Ralph Carney in the band, yeah. and then Chris Butler, and became what more people know as Tim Huey. Um, I think that Peter and I, uh, you know, he used, I was saying that, I told Aaron this, he used to hang out uh, at Tim Huey practices a lot, uh, Charlotte, did you guys actually have a place in Akron for a while? Like yeah. when, when he was working with Sue and Debbie and stuff? Yeah, it was just for a few months. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought, because I'm thinking, well, if they were just Cleveland, it, you know, I, I couldn't imagine us, like when we would, a bunch of us would go to dinner, and Peter was just hanging out in the basement running around like a puppy dog. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you mentioned, what they did. Nothing really sounds like Tim Huey. That was sort of the brilliant thing. Well, know, that, so. was, that was the secret to our lack of success. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, other, uh, what other bands were influencing you at that time? I mean, Well, again, because it would probably be cool to reference Pete again, is uh, I remember Clinton in one of his books described me as the Velvet Huey. And so... <laughs> You know, it, it started really going off the tracks when, um, uh, after I spent an evening listening to, I heard her call my name and Sister Ray. Yeah. And that was, that just sort of uh, forced a chemical change of sorts in my mind. And, and Peter and I very definitely bonded over the Velvets. You know, that was, and then we would just, you know, there was no real scene in Akron, so you could sort of do anything that you wanted to do, and there was nobody to call you on. So, 
If we were listening to Gong and Soft Machine and Faust and the Velvets and the Stooges, and you know, I, I didn't realize this till much, much later in our career when Robert Criscow um, sort of suggested to me that we were a prog band. <laughs> I did not hit him. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, come on, the dean of American. Right. Right. <laughs> but he was, but he was, uh, I mean, he was a fan. I mean, he, oh, yeah, yeah. Around, you know, I mean, he was, he was largely responsible for us going down this little road that had us ending up uh, with a failed album on Warner Brothers. But, <laughs> but um, so that's what we kind of were, you know. It's, it's like as we got better on our instruments, we played more shit. And as we did it, we still, in the spirit of what we did with the Velvets, doing 20-minute versions of Sister Ray and doing TVI and Loose, um, we played it all really fast and really loud. Right. So, so Chris, very I, mean, much, I mean, he did a review, but could you talk also what we were talking earlier about Peter's review of the band? <laughs> Yeah, it just started out by saying that after a conversation with our bass player, Mark Price, that we realized that the secret to everything was the D chord. <laughs> and last night I was thinking about that, and I realized that that's pretty true. <laughs> Anybody who's a musician who plays guitar knows that if you just play a D chord, there's so many places you can go from there. And, uh, or the E. Yeah, the E's okay. Get no, out no, of no. Get him out of what are you? <laughs> yeah. That's wrong. Sorry, check it. <laughs> did did, did uh, so? In Cleve was uh, did you did you cover uh, Ted Huey as well? Yeah, I mean did we we did include the, all the the Akron bands. I think uh, Devo were represented. Huey were represented. Bizarros. Mm -hmm. um, I mean the clone label. I think. I, as I recall, Nick came up to the Drome uh, when he was investigating the concept of doing the clone record label and uh, met Peter and, and Crocus and uh, they both encouraged him to, to do it and that's how the first uh, Bizarro's EP came out. I think Crocus wrote the very first piece about Tim Huey. Which was real nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've always liked David. In there or in scene or in, 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 I, in I think it was in the scene of that. Yeah. Yeah, he had a weekly column in mm -hmm. the scene for a right. long time, right? Crock of Bush. Yeah. I think he was working there and then he eventually started to yeah, edit, I remember. Um Jim any like when you look back and you know um any favorite uh, articles or you know that, that stand out to you now as you look back on the, uh, all of the uh, the previous things that are, you know stand out as your favorite? Um, well, I really like the conceptual stuff a lot, and of course Charlotte's article, but like the whole concept of avant garage, which we we did in Cleve Three. Um, you know, I was at art school at the time. Andrew was very very well versed. Andrew Klimek was very well versed in you know artistic manifestos and all that kind of stuff. So we decided we, Andrew actually coined that term, by the way, Andrew Kleinbeck coined the term Avant Garage. And we kind of wrote an editorial about the Avant Garage and I went out and took a bunch of photographs of garages in my neighborhood and we started making like commentary on, you know, how great these garages were. Who can afford a home? You can get a garage. And the whole concept was, you know, that the Avant Garde was happening in the garages around town. And uh, when the Ubu went to Europe, um, the French fans had gone nuts over the fact that they were using, you know, Avant Garage. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and, you know, at that point, uh, David started using the Avant Garage quite a bit, you know, as a, as a tag for uh, Ubu. And, I'm, you know, I'm glad he did. I'm glad that he popularized it, you know, because I think it's a great term. So, uh, so that's probably one of my favorites, definitely. I just think it's important to stress that the Cleezine, that Jim's Magazine, had a real intellectual current. It was very different than Punk Magazine in New York, which, I mean, don't get me wrong, the New York punk scene had its intellectual streak too, but the punk zine there, punk, was trying to be dumb, like <laughs> Mad Magazine dumb. It was kind of like more like, it was more Ramones than it was television. So it's interesting how the Cleezine was not afraid to be smart. Uh, in fact, it insisted on being smart, and I think that's cool. 
Thanks. Absolutely. And you mentioned Charlotte's article. Can you talk about you know using that article for your research and your work? I mean, it's Again, those, were, those were different times. Yeah, it's just such a great piece. Well, it's like the Rosetta Stone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She's embarrassed. Look at her. <laughs> uh, Char so, Charlotte's just a wonderful writer. It was also a real pleasure to find some of her uh, other lesser known pieces in uh, various publications and her, her poetry. And um, But boy, those are different times. It's just a very evocative piece of writing. It's and very quotable. Yeah. Thanks. I just think it was important. It's such an amazing piece. Um, I, I want to go back to, you, you mentioned Price and um, Carney. Can you talk a little bit about working with them? They're such you know, important you know, pieces of the puzzle here. There are times that I feel like I'm the normal guy who's the <laughs> selig in the room. Uh, working with, uh, we, we drafted Ralph Carney right out of high school. And um, he was just a remarkable talent. He was just a... Uh, and towards the end of his life, he actually put out uh, some uh, records that uh, was Ralph's serious jazz album, and uh, a couple of them. And it was like after playing everything that has ever been placed on earth to play, um, he decided he was going to do a couple of records where he wasn't being a cartoon character. And <laughs> they were great, great records. They were really, really nice. And and. Mark Price, one time we were doing a gig at JB's in Kent, and we were in the middle of a song, and he did this bass riff. And it was a bass, it's four strings. And it was so bizarre that the entire band just stopped spontaneously. <laughs> and uh, I punched him. <laughs> and then we just picked the song back up where we left off. It was, it was, it was genius. These were guys who would do things that... Um, we're just not heard before and then immediately forget that the next chord was a G. <laughs> you know, so it was a lot of work. Yeah. It was a lot of work. Can you so, I'll go ahead. I was going to say, so <clears throat> these shows you're playing, like, these shows you're playing, is it always, you know, is it always the same kind of crowd of people? Crowd? Crowd, <laughs> crowd right. <laughs> I, it, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I've, I've, I've booked and play plenty of shows where there's four people in the room. Um, but you know, where they're just people wandering in and going, oh, what? Right. But yes. And then they wander out. Any particularly memorable or crazy shows? The Viking Saloon. Um, we were doing a show, and Greg, oh, I shouldn't talk about this. <laughs> okay. It's just you and me here. No, yeah, that's a, there was a band that, there was a band from Akron called The Brambles, and, uh, one of the guys in the band, Greg Burry, was a person who would like pour lighter fluid on his jacket and set it on fire. And you know. so he came to the Viking one day, one night, and we all went out to the parking lot, you know, to throw a frisbee around or something. <laughs> and we, and for some reason, we were inspired by this athletic achievement of ours to uh, walk back into the Viking, turn all of our amps up as loud as we possibly could. All of our shirts came off. It was like, uh, these Akron boys think they're like the MC5 or something. <laughs> and we managed to drive everyone, except one person who went up with us, out of the place. <laughs> <laughs> but in our first set, we did a, we, we were real proud of this, we did a version of um, Babies on Fire, where I was doing the, <laughs> the Robert Fripp part, yeah, right? Uh, <laughs> To a, to a blue box, an MXR blue box, and Michael Elward sat on a stool with a short wave receiver running through his amp really loud, trying to find all the crap in between the stations. Mm -hmm. So that was a fun night. <laughs> but, uh, no, we, we had a tendency to uh, attract a, a fairly narrow cast crowd. Sure, sure. <laughs> we were really eclectic. I mean, uh, when we left Warner Brothers, various yeah. members of the band had things to say about how Warner's handled us and who screwed us and who did fine. And and I was just like, guys, listen to the album. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm really proud of it, but boy, did we play fast. And who's going to know? <laughs> But somehow, uh, you know, I, I was talking to you earlier, the, the band has lived on. There is a cult around it, you know, like, just because I think it's such an interesting sound, you know? I mean, what do you think is the lasting impact of the band? 
Uh, you know, I wasn't aware there was one. There is. <laughs> I, 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 I think, like I told you, music heads. What us, what's the lasting effect of it? Us deciding that we did not want to do <laughs> I Know What Boys Like. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, really? We were, we were so elitist geeks. Like, not going to do that. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not going to play it. Wow. And then, uh, no, it was, was better. It enough? was better. <laughs> it really was better that we didn't because um, Chris really should have had a band called The Waitresses to do that song. Right. And it worked. It was great. I'm so proud of everything he's done. Yeah. yeah. Chris Butler, everybody. <laughs> Jim, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to go back. I forgot to ask you about, uh, can you talk about the birth of Psychotronic as well in, in, your, in your Z? Oh, sure. Um, well, Michael Weldon got hired pretty much right after I did. I think John Thompson, Johnny Dromat, as he's well known, um, wanted uh, Mike to come in and kind of manage the place for him so that you know he didn't have to worry about that. And he recruited Mike from Northern, which was a one-stop record shop downtown where all the different record stores could pick up their, their current releases without going to each different distributor. Right? Rack Chopper. Rack Chopper. Right, and so, um, so you know, I, Michael was friends with um, my girlfriend at the time, and he was a friend of the Climax, and um, so he went with uh, Johnny and I up to New York, and I remember him like shopping for different uh, movie fan scenes while we were up there picking up different stills in some of the some of the uh, movie memorabilia shops, and um, he had a collection of of press kits, I think his father worked for the Cleveland Press, and he would get all these press kits for different monster movies and stills and that kind of thing. And Mike had a pretty good collection of that stuff already at that time, and he, I mean, it wasn't just those types of movies, I mean, he liked other movies as well, because I used to see him at like the Cedar Lee or like, uh, you know, the Case Western Reserve Film Society, but um, he really did like these films that he called psychotronic films and he had done his own fanzine called Pix, P-I-X, <coughs> which was a one-off uh, dedicated to Roger Corman mm. and um, as we were laying out trying to come up with enough copy to fill Clee 2, you know, he's like, well, hey, you know, can I, can I write about these films? And I said, sure, you know, why not? So um, he took the last two pages of Clee 2 and, and did what I guess was the the first psychotronic and then um, it wasn't too long after that that he moved to New York and uh, once he got to New York he, he carried that concept further and he contacted all the um, television stations up there because they know in advance what movies they're going to play so for like a month or two in advance he had the schedule of everything that was going to be aired in the New York area you know on the network television and he started psychotronic that way it's like a TV guide for the upcoming movies yes. in the New York area and and those were all you know hand done and Xeroxed and um, it just became such a huge thing that yeah it's like trying I mean, books and is, is he still going uh, oh yeah he had a store I think he's got a store in Augusta and Augusta. I just I just talked to him last week and um, he seemed he, like he's doing fine he ordered a copy of Ain't It Fun. All right. Packed it up, presented it to him. So, Jim, you know, I'm sure you get this question a lot, but the the future of of Clee, what is? Can we? Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, um, so I'm actually thinking about doing a new issue. Yes. Yeah. Right? For 2024. And because uh, there's a lot of interesting bands, I think again in Cleveland, but so it really came about because I ran into Johnny Dromet at the Numbers Band gig a couple weeks ago at the Tree Lawn. And I said, you know, John, somebody needs to tell the story of the drone, because I think the drone is really a crucial part of this whole story. And I, I don't think without the drone that the Cleveland would have had the, the legendary status that it does have, because of the Pagans and Boo Boo working there, Peter working there, Devo playing there. I mean, it really was like a, a, a center where everybody could come and, you know, cross boundaries and talk about music and you know I think without that it really 
and of course all the crazy ads that he used to run in yeah. the scene and all the fights that he would have with the scene in WMMS. So, um, so I said, you know, we really got to document this stuff while, while we're still around because who better to tell the story than us? Right. And he's like, yeah, I agree. And so he, they're considering uh, repressing all the drone singles in a box set. And then uh, I reached out to Michael Weldon, I reached out to David Thomas, and they're all prepared to write memoirs of working at the drone. So I think the new Klee will be a drone issue. Love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Harvey, I, I, I kind of could you talk about Gold Productions? Uh, you know, like so. After we left left Warner Brothers, we started putting together demos for other labels, and predictably, each label because Tim Huey was a little bit on the eclectic side. Everybody <laughs> in A and R would say, "God, I really like that second song. Can you give me more?" And then another label would like the third song and say, can you give us more? And we were suddenly realized that we were becoming a demo factory. <laughs> so ultimately, uh, I moved to New York and uh, got a job working to move Todd Rundgren's video gear from Studio B at Bearsville <laughs> Recording down to Utopia Video that was built for him uh, by Alan... Um, uh, Grossman, um, Albert Grossman. And then I worked for him for a while, then moved to New York and started doing more and more video production. So yeah, I ended up with a production company called Gold Teleproductions, and we did a couple of things that had some integrity. And uh, just a couple. So I'm getting excited. I uh, did a lot of work with MTV, so you see what I'm saying here. And um, a bunch of documentary work, and it was it was great fun. I, I, I did tell you though that in the beginning, um, we were shooting a lot with MTV networks, and it was kind of an interesting thing to realize that I was living a, 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 a just an extremely greater rock and roll existence than I had in my entire time playing rock and roll. <laughs> um, MTV was sort of a rock star there for a while, right. which was really kind of interesting. Um, so you're not doing that work in, at all anymore? I, I, I finished with that company after, my company, after 20 God years, uh, selling it out to my, uh, my partner who had his feet on the ground in New York. Nice. Um, and now I'm just, uh, you know, living the retired life. And but it doesn't sound like he high fives and half clip. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> you could talk yeah. about you, you kept playing. That would he keep at. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I ended up getting drafted into this band that was actually sort of like a part of the Akron sound that was the generation following Tim Huey, yeah. uh, called the Hi Fives, and that band just evaporated when we killed off two of our members yeah. over a three-day period. <laughs> but I also am working on um, a project that's. So far, it's just a band camp project called uh, Golems of the Red Planet. Everybody write that down. <laughs> and it's not like Gollum, it's Golems, you know, the, the ancient Jewish mud people, um, which is a, an exploration of uh, a, a book of uh, music written by John Zorn. Um, and because his stuff is all in minor keys, uh, my bass player and our zoonologist in the band decided that that would be perfect for surf music. So we formed this surf band, and I do most of the writing to supplement what Zorn wrote, because they're all very, very small pieces in his book called The Masada. And uh, the interesting thing about it, which makes it very Huey-like, is that I don't really like surf music. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have a couple of favorite surf bands, and I love the crap out of them for like three songs, and then I have to go eat. Sure, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> you know. But so I, I, it gives me the chance to be insidious, and uh, as long as there's something surfy in it, I mean, it could just be the sound of a Fender guitar with a lot of reverb. Um, we, we, we have a starting point, but then we, we kind of go off the, the beaten path. And the nicest thing about it is that Zorn loves it. 
Nice. Which is great. It's uh, nice to ha hear from him yeah. and have him go, hey, nice job, guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna uh, there's just so many, uh, you know, like look out here music heads. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questions for, for anybody here if you have about, about any fun or to Harvey or to Jim. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, for Aaron. <clears throat> so this is about the cover of Ain't It Fun. So in Ain't It Fun, uh, there's this recurring motif of that famous photo of Peter just in chains. So uh, how deliberate was that motif um, as it relates to the grander scheme of the book, or was it just for lack of uh, photographic evidence of Peter's existence or whatever? No, it was very deliberate in the sense that I think it's the most iconic image of Peter. It's really just that simple. Um, it's just the most iconic image of Peter. <laughs> so, that was the, can you expand on that? Uh, Joe Warren, whose brother Tom is a pretty fairly well-known uh, photographer in New York. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it just, uh, that's the image. That's the, when you think of Peter, that's the image you think of. So when I painted it into like five or six melt barrels. Yeah. <laughs> any other um, any other questions? <clears throat> Come on. Go ahead. Well, one one thing I remember reading about Mike Weldon was that I think his father worked for the station that did Gulardi. So that may be where the, the movie connection came. Yeah, that's a great, and I love that in the book that you, you just hear, uh, you, you keep on him with this recurring, all those guys, something about Gullardi just lit yeah. them up. I don't know if you have David <laughs> Thomas has yeah. a whole lecture on Gullardi. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Gullardi yeah, was definitely all. a thing with those guys. Huge. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, you know, taking back the psycho. I mean, I don't think any one person changed like, the, the, like a sort of generation <laughs> I don't think I don't think people uh, my age or Jake's age or your age can I don't think we, we can I don't think we'll ever truly understand how influential Goulardi was. I mean, we can hear about it and we can like oh we can you know I get I get it, but we'll never fully understand. It fucked their shit. Uh, <laughs> it did. It was the like, on this panel. for the rest of their lives. Still talking about it. It was on for like two years or three years. Three years. I remember Friday nights. My mother making grocery store pizza and having people over to see Gallardi and waiting for him to like blow up a turtle with an M80. <laughs> um, it's interesting because my generation very easily, it could be said that everything changed when the Beatles came. And everything did change when the Beatles came. But prior to that, if you lived in Akron or Cleveland, there was Gallardi, there was Ernie. This, this iconic character, this creature who was probably really drunk, um, <laughs> insulting the shit out of Pulitzer Prize winner Dorothy Fulton, <laughs> and just um, really wreaking havoc yeah. in media. Because keep in mind also, that's we're talking about a generation that only had three TV stations. Right. We didn't have a lot of stuff to watch. And Tim Conway. And Tim <laughs> I learned about that so many years later that Ernie and Tim were a uh, a, uh, a, a duet. How many? Yes. Yeah. yeah, Dobie Gillis, you had that in there too. That kind yep. of <laughs> and he's the father of uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, so you already yeah. can see where genetics are at yeah, play. Absolutely. Here. Well, that's a good hand. Are you your hand up? Yeah, I was just curious, like, is there a distinction, like a unique Akron sound and Cleveland sound? Because I kind of. See, Akron and Cleveland is part of this larger thing, right? Well, all the clubs were in Cleveland. I mean, we, we had no place to play in Akron. Um, there was one place where the Rubber City Rebels played and, and Devo got in a couple of gigs. But frankly, when Devo was trying to do a showcase, it was Tim Huey doing three nights a week at JB's in Kent that um, they asked us if they could use one of our nights in order to do it. And even then, us having three nights a week in Kent was because this weird guy who ran the upstairs bar was, this is really messed up, that he was a Grover Washington Jr. fan and he heard that we had a saxophone in our band. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, oh yeah, 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 we'll play. Um, <laughs> but I think about it, it's like when anybody around here who knows of us 
knew us from playing the Viking Saloon or the Pirate's Cove or the Mistake. It was, it had, we had to come up here for it. And I said there really wasn't a scene in Akron, but that I think benefited us. You know, nobody, we didn't have any peer pressure um, to say you shouldn't really be doing that. I used to say if I came up with the idea of attaching a pickup to a two by four and throwing a watermelon at it and running it through a VCS3 synthesizer and I were to call Mark Mothersbaugh and say, hey, guess what I'm doing? He'd say, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> Harvey's really welcome to disagree with me, but I think uh, if there is a distinction between the first wave of Cleveland and Akron bands. I think uh, Akron had more of a sense of humor, which you, see, you. you <laughs> see in Devo and, as well as in Tim Huey. That's possible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I always thought David had a real sense of humor, but it was he certainly did. But it was a little, it was more it was oblique. Always, it was not. Yeah, it was really oblique and really dark. I love that guy. <laughs> Yes, Valerie. Uh, me. Uh, uh, can you talk about your evolution of like your relationship with Peter um, from when you first started writing the book to now? Oh my God, that's like the hard thanks. That's the <laughs> hardest question. <laughs> that's his wife, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Turn the screw, Val. Oh, oh, he's finally gonna answer you. Uh, <laughs> every day for seven years. <laughs> what are you doing, Eric? Relationship with him changing at all or anything? I don't. I don't know if I don't know if I can answer that. I wanted I to ask that question too. Though. Okay. Uh, how did my relationship with Peter change over the the, pro yeah, the process? Over seven years of like. I, 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 I'm like I honestly don't know. Um, I think I think I, I I think I ended up with more questions than I did answers. I think that's maybe the best response I can give to that. <laughs> that's probably the result of probing into anything too deeply. Uh, my girlfriend, I have to credit her with this, is the uh, inverted pyramid of knowledge. You know one thing, but you know you don't know two things. You learn those two things. There's four things you don't know. <laughs> you know you don't know them. You learn those four things, and this goes on into infinity. Yeah. Oh, I thought it went on until you knew everything. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? I, I, I smoked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Aaron. Uh. <laughs> oh, this is his brother. Friends <laughs> 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 Cruz. Family's coming for it. There's so much about music in the book, obviously, and you speak crazy about you know the art and the statement, but you're not a musician, and there's almost Nothing really about like the technical or craft side of music. Was that ever a temptation in the research? Did you ever feel like you needed to know about the craft, uh, the, the the technical side of music writing and all? I stayed clear of it. Yeah. I was just like, if I I knew if I did it, I'd always wonder like, did I get this wrong? I don't think about chords or <laughs> gear or recording, and I just. I made a point of staying as far away from it as possible. I even tried to avoid drawings of people playing music. <laughs> I, I had to do it here and there, but like I just wanted like drawings of people talking, you know. Inside, yeah. I mean, I, 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 it's more exciting than that. Though. <laughs> No, I, I didn't want, I just like, I'm not, it's not even really about, not even really about music. I don't write about music. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just. You do. You really do. <laughs> I mean, that answers the question 100%. Okay, it's, yeah. <coughs> Writing about music is like dancing for architecture. That's right. So and it's not that I don't think it's um, worthy of talking about, because well, it yeah. is. Um, and anyone else that would like to explore it uh, should. It just wasn't, that wasn't my place. Yeah. I like this, your family come after you, so your mom has a difficult question. <laughs> he would kill me. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I have a question more towards Harvey. Um, so when I, was, when I was a little girl, and still, like, one of my favorite records that when I started to get into music, my dad had a copy of the Scratch and Sniff Akron record. And so I'd like to know a little bit more about like what it was like with Stiff, like recording that, and like what that what that process was like. Because I mean, that's how I got into Afro music was with the Bizarros, 
with Tim Huey and with you know, Chai Pig and all that stuff. Like, what was that record like? Because I I have my dad's copy that like kind of sort of maybe scratches, and like I I've, I've also bought like multiple copies now that like that one really scratches, you know. But like that's one of my like that's my my prized record. Like I love that scratches and comp. So I want to know a little bit more about that if you don't mind. Well, a lot of stuff went on in in that period where. Um, Oh God, Butler and um, Liam Sternberg would get together and make up bands. I mean, this is where <laughs> Jane Eyre came from. Yeah. This is where um, um, Rachel Sweet's on. Thank you, too. Rachel yes. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, the reason I I would have remembered that her name started with an R, but not <laughs> her name, is why I can't really speak to it all that much. Um, Stiff got enamored with this concept that Akron was the new Liverpool. And, uh, it's just so hey, weird. Aaron, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. And I know, I know it is. And we're all Great. sitting in basements in Akron going, what's happening here? <laughs> so they all just, uh, they all just swept in and visited for about 40 minutes and left and did this album. And, you know, we just recorded stuff the way that we recorded it and submitted it. And with uh, a few made-up bands, so that everything would fill out an entire album, because there weren't that many of us, and so that's the, where it happened. The, there's the tire side and then the plate side, like so. It's it's an awesome record. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was fun being part of it, and cool. and it smelled really interesting. <laughs> it smelled like a John Waters <laughs> movie. <laughs> Copy and it's still a little bit scratches and it smells very interesting. Oh, I'm, I'm sure it does. I'll give you that, you know? yeah, Mine well. still smells like rubber. Yeah. Yeah. Angie, I, I guess I was just going to say that that like three years earlier, I think it was like Anastasia Pantheus was trying to sell Cleveland as the new Liverpool because of the raspberries and stuff like that. Stacy, <laughs> Stacy, Stacy. <laughs> Harvey, what didn't Stiff run a contest where you could win a trip to Akron? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I, I actually think that since Facebook happened, I actually heard from somebody who won that trip. <laughs> uh, and then I unfriended them. <laughs> Okay. Well, <laughs> thanks for asking about that. Well, we want to. We really want to thank the Beachland for doing this. This has been uh, really wonderful. Thank you so much. See, thank, thanks, Mark. You know, uh, this book we really feel it's important. Like, you know, as someone who's been archiving the history of the city, I am so glad to have this and you've answered so many questions for us in the future. So, thanks everybody for coming out on a Sunday. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming, Jeff. Thank you. Um, Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd especially like to thank our guests, Harvey and Jim, and I'd like to thank John for hosting this. Uh, I understand that some of you want me to sign books. Uh, I'm going to grab a cigarette first, and then I'll, uh, I'll be at the table and I'll sign your, sign your books. Thank you to all our guests. Thank you all, everybody, for coming, especially on this Sunday night. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, Aaron will be back in five minutes to sign some books there at the back of the room. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you to all our guests. Thank you to John, Harvey, Jim, Jake, and Aaron. Thank you so much. Thanks, and thank you to the Beachland Ballroom and Tavern for having us.